You're listening to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, Episode 76, Tax Tips for Digital Nomads, with guest Bobby Casey, founder of GlobalWealthProtection.com. Hey, welcome back to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Ash, and today we're going to talk about the digital nomad lifestyle and tax protection. So today's guest is Bobby Casey. He is the founder and owner of GlobalWealthProtection.com, which specializes in asset protection, international investments, unique income strategies, need that cash flow secondary passports and international living. So Bobby, welcome to Liberty Entrepreneurs. Hey Ash, thanks for having me today. Uh, So Bobby, tell us, you know, tax season's gonna be upon us here in just a few months. We're recording this mid-November, 2017. Um, By the time the audience hears it, it's probably gonna be towards the end of the year, but tax season's coming. And I know that digital nomads is a big area of confusion for them. So just fill in the gaps here. What is global wealth protection and how did you get started in this? Sure. Yes, basically, we our tagline or our motto, so to speak, is internationalize your business, your wealth, and your life. And basically, it, it, came, it came about a long time ago. I've, I've had several businesses over the years, and back in, let's see, I guess late 90s, early 2000s, um, I, I had accumulated some assets. I had a couple of businesses going and a bunch of assets, and I just... You know, I, I started thinking I need to do something to protect my own wealth. Actually, I was late 90s, 97, 98, 99, something like that. And I decided I needed to do something to protect my assets. So I started researching different strategies for uh, protecting my own wealth. And um, I, I hired a couple of uh, um, experts in the field that helped walk me through some strategies and setting up some structures to put in place to protect my own wealth. Now, it, if, if I can rewind just a bit farther, growing up, my dad was always a business owner. Since I was born, he was a business owner, but his area of expertise was in accounting. He was a CPA. And so, you know, we, we had the kind of dinner table talks where we're, we're figuring out tax deductions and, and, uh, corporate structure planning to, to to learn how to minimize taxes. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure, 14 I'm sure, years old. Yeah, I'm sure you're a hoot at dinner parties. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was it was uh I, always the life of the party. <laughs> you know, ha- having the in depth discussions of S corps versus uh, LLCs, right? Right. But you know, I mean, honestly, I was 13, 14 years old and and knew the difference between all these corporate structures because it's just something you you pick up you know, over the years sitting at the dinner table with dad. So it was kind of burned into my psyche that, um, you know, you you could use different legal structures to minimize your tax, minimize your taxes and protect your assets. So fast forward to late nineties, I had some assets and I decided, you know, I need to do something about this. So it kind of, it kind of happened. I think like a lot of businesses, it happens out of our own personal necessity and, and then we end up seeing an opportunity for something, right? I mean, a, a lot of product businesses start like that, right? You find, you find you you need a widget, you can't find a widget, so you build the widget and then sell the widget. So, yep. it's it's a little bit like that. And I created um, a structure for for myself. You know, I mean, I, I like with my experts, I had I had hired people to do it. I mean, I realized a long time ago. And this is also something my dad taught me. I realized a long time ago, do what you're good at, hire people to <laughs> hire people that are good at what they do. There's, there's no point in becoming an expert at everything. So I hired a, hired a couple of people to help me set this up. Well, after that, I became really, really fascinated with the topic. And I ended up helping over the next course of next few years I was helping a lot of my friends do the same thing I did so we we helped put a structure in place for them we we researched their business and their assets and stuff and we we 
put a structure in place for these guys. And it just kind of gradually progressed. And in the mid 2000s, I sold, I sold a couple of businesses, early 2000s and mid 2000s, I sold a couple of businesses. And then I've been really doing this full time since and basically kind of went down the rabbit hole with it and, and uh, ended up researching a lot more in depth and getting a lot more strategies to uh, d develop for, for my clients. Yeah, and I think a lot of my audience is either digital nomads or a lot of them are actually want to be digital nomads. They hear about this lifestyle of no longer having to work for the man, <clears throat> being able to travel. You know, 90% of my audience is still in their 20s or 30s. And if you don't have a lot of liability or debt, then you can build a lifestyle business, you know, cash flowing a couple thousand dollars a month even, and start traveling the world. I'm living here in Chiang Mai. And you can live a very, very comfortable lifestyle here on 2000 US or much less per month. Um, so <clears throat> one of the reasons that I brought you on is let's make the assumption that somebody has a, a small online business. Maybe it's an Amazon FBA business, some small SaaS business, or even a consultancy business, uh, you know, kind of like what I have with Liberty Virtual Assistance. But they're making, you know, three to five, maybe six, seven thousand dollars a month. And they're looking to make that step. They've really been concentrating on building the business so far, haven't spoken to anybody tax wise, haven't incorporated any type of structure, and they've been channeling everything through their personal bank accounts. And now they're looking to take the next step and actually maybe have an LLC and then move outside. So let's concentrate on the domestic, getting someone set up domestically within the United States, and then we'll see what happens when they start traveling and if there's a need for maybe an international IBC or international bank accounts and stuff like that. So set the stage for us here, Bobby. I am making $5,000 a month in my online business, and I've been channeling it all through my own personal bank accounts. What would you recommend? Okay, I'll get to that in just, just a second because I, I want to... I want to hit on a point you, you mentioned before, because you got You do have a lot of people listening and, and I've talked to a lot of people too, that are making four five, six, eight grand a month saying, well, I make pretty decent money, but I can't really afford this international lifestyle. And that's a common thread. They're like, man, you know, I'm living here in whatever, let's say Ohio. And they say, ah, I can't, I just can't afford to make this jump. Well, the reality is you can already afford it most likely you just don't really understand the, the math of the situation so let, let me give you kind of a breakdown and I, i've done the numbers on this but first of all if you are living abroad and and I, we'll get into the technicalities of it a minute so i'm just going to kind of sure be general at first but if you're living abroad as an american so i guess we're we're primarily talking to Americans, but a lot of this can apply. I have a lot of Canadian clients, a lot of uh, British clients, a lot of European clients, even a lot of Australian clients also. And this applies to them. The strategies are slightly different on how to accomplish it. But, you know, as we discussed, I'm going to kind of target this towards um, an American audience, first of all. But I don't, I don't want any other listeners to think you're excluded because there are strategies for you also. Um, we just accomplish it slightly differently from a technical perspective. So let's imagine you're making, let's say I'm just going to make my math simple, hundred grand a year. You're making $8,000 a month um, living in the States. Well, first of all, between state and federal tax, you're probably paying anywhere from 30 or 40% of that off sliced right off the top to, you know, to pay tax. So, Let's even go on the low side and say you're paying 30% out. You get a bunch of tax deductions and whatever. So you're, you're netting 70 grand. So right off the bat, just by moving abroad, once you qualify uh, for the foreign earned income exclusion, you keep that 30,000. You can, you can make your full 100,000. So right off the bat, you just save $30,000 a year by moving to another country. I, you yeah. can't discount that. And, That's and, huge. And, and just real quick, tell us what the, the, that exclusion is. <clears throat> Foreign earned income exclusion is um, if, if you're an American citizen and you're living abroad, if you want, we can get into the details on this in a minute um, on how to qualify for it. But basically you get about a hundred right now, I guess it's 102,000 a year. 
you can earn tax-free on your earned income. That does not include like dividend income or any type of passive income, although there are ways to reclassify that as well. Um, but basically, whatever you earn in your profession, whether it's, um, you know, selling products or consulting or whatever, um, you, you can basically, your first 100000 roughly is tax-free. Plus, you get a housing allowance in addition to that. That It varies based on what country you live in, but it's anywhere from about thirty to $80,000 of a housing allowance. So, ultimately, you can get approximately $140,000, $150,000 tax-free just by living out of the U.S. So, if you make anything under that number, then that chunk of tax is back in your pocket. And the name is foreign earned income. So do you have to be living out of the States as well as working and like getting your revenue from outside the United States as well? Or can you live outside of the States and have a U.S. business with U.S. clients and getting paid from the U.S. system? That's a, that's a, that's a great question and a great point. Actually, it's really, really simple. All you have to do is your physical ass needs to be out of the U.S. <laughs> For all but like 30 days or something of the year. It depends. Okay, so we'll get into it then. So it depends. There's two ways to qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. Number one, it's called the physical presence test, meaning you need to be physically out of the U.S. Um, 330, day, yeah, 330 days per year in a rolling 12-month period. So, for example, let's say – you decide right now, okay, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to move abroad, but I'll get it done, settle my affairs, whatever, and I'm going to move July 1st, 2018. So that means July 1st, as long as your intent is to stay out of the country for at least 330 days between July 1st, 18, and June 30, 19, mm. um, you can prorate the first six months of 18. Oh, okay. Right. okay. That makes sense. Yep. So you, so on the physical presence test, you can actually prorate the year. I mean, you could, you could have started on December 1st. You can prorate the month. Right. So I, I just simplified you prorate on July 1st. So instead of a hundred thousand in foreign earned income exclusion, you get 50. Right. Okay. Right. Plus, plus the housing allowance. Right. <clears throat> so that's the first way to qualify. That's, Technically the easiest, but it, it's not, I, in my opinion, it's not the best because it's the most limiting way to qualify because literally you have to be physically out of the U.S. 330 days in that, in that 12 month period. And that, that includes your time. Days. So if you get on the plane, if you're in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and you get on the plane to fly to the States for Christmas to see your family, the day, the moment you step on the plane, you are in the U.S., so to speak. It, right. Travel days count as being in the U.S. from the day, because, you, you know, I mean, depending on your route, it could take you two days to get back from Chiang Mai to the U.S. if right. you have some layovers somewhere. Sure. Right? So, um, anyway, so that's the first way to qualify. That's the easiest way, but it's the most restricting, because you really, really have to be careful you're not in the Just U.S. Just not go back to the U.S., right? This is like, I'm going to live internationally guaranteed i have no interest in coming back if i do come back i've got 30 days 35 days or so where i can sprinkle around and go back to the u.s for business or for whatever but um that's that uh the second is the bona fide residency test right bona fide residency test um and i'll give you a quick example on the last one why i don't like that i got a really good friend of mine um who was actually he was living in Chiang Mai until recently and he got a call. His dad, um, his cancer came back, right. and he had he got he was in the hospital, and he jumped on the next plane out of Thailand back, back to where his parents lived. And you know now his dad's laid up, and he only has a few months left to live. Like he's, I mean, he's like on his last. I mean, I'm not yeah. trying to be overly morbid, but he's on his last leg, so to speak. And because of this, the government if there's a lot of money. If, because of this situation, if my friend had not established residency in another country, he would for sure not qualify for right. the foreign earned income exclusion because of the physical presence test. Because he's going to be back there for a couple of months, you know, spending time with his dad. 
he has no choice, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to my buddy every couple of days. Like, his dad is not well, so he's going to be there. So the other one is the um, uh, bona fide residency test. Now, this is a little bit more gray area and a little bit more difficult to qualify for, and it will cost you some money. Um, you're going to have to come up some money to, to get it done. But the benefit is if you qualify for the physical presence test, you have a lot more flexibility on when the amount of time you spend back in the if U.S. If you qualify for the bona fide residency test. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. Yeah. I'm, I misspoke. If you qualify for the bona fide residency test, you, you get a lot more time and a lot more gray area because the intent of the bona fide residency test is you need to have um, legal residence in another country. And that needs to be your, let's call it tax home, so to speak. Right. That needs to be your tax home for, for your legal purposes. So if, if you have that tax home, you have now like extricated yourself from the U S um, system of, well, not completely from the U S system of taxes, but you're, you're no longer a resident. Right. in the U S so they can't claim you. Um, and you, you can prove it. Okay. Here's my, you know, Panamanian residence card. I'm a Panamanian resident, so to speak. Yeah. And so because of that, then you get a lot more flexibility because you're showing your intent is to live. And we'll just keep using Panama as an example. Sure. Your intent is to live in Panama. So <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Let's say you get a job. You work for, let's say, Shell Oil Company, and you get a job working in Dubai with a two-year contract or a three-year contract. You would not qualify for the bona fide residency, even though you have residency in Dubai in that case, because it's a short-term contract living in Dubai. It, it shows your intent is mm-hmm. to return back to the U.S. You know, once your contract expires. Right. That makes sense? Yep. But – if you're a digital nomad and you could live wherever you want and you're, you're selling your widgets on Amazon, you get residency in Panama, your business is completely virtual, right? Now you don't, you don't have the intent. So there's a couple of things. Number one, you need to have legal residency in another country. Number two, you cannot have a primary residence or any home whatsoever in the U.S. Mm. I say you cannot have a home in the U.S. That does not mean you cannot have investment property in the u.s mm-hmm. let's say you got 10 rental houses in kansas and you're you're making income on them you're going to pay tax on that income because the property itself is located in the u.s um but you don't have a home so to speak in the u.s those are just investments and what if you rent what if you want to come back to the states and you and you sign a six-month lease or something um well it Six six months you could six months will be pushing it because there's another there's another thing called the um I always draw a blank on this. The the um there's a there's a calculation to determine your like your tax your if you become a default tax resident in the oh, US. Right. For just staying there um, just being there. Yeah, so there's a there's a calculation for your your uh oh my god I'll, I'll remember it in a second yeah so you can do it but there's a calculation for that yeah there's a there's a calculation for that but basically what it is the way it's calculated if you were you take the number of days you were in the u.s two years ago times 40 percent okay i'm sorry times 20 percent. i got it backwards so let's say you were in the u.s two years ago 100 days right. okay 20% of that is 20, yeah. right? And let's say you were in the U.S. last year, 100 days. You take 40% of last year's number, so it's 40 days. 20, 40, plus the number of days you're in the U.S. in the current year. And let's say it's 100 days. I'm just simplifying. Yeah. So 100 plus 40 plus 20 is 160 days, right? Yeah. 160. As long as that number is under 183, then you are not a default tax resident in the U.S. So it comes out to be about 112 is the average. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you, you can't say you can be in the country 112 days a year because like, like my buddy who just went back to the States, he's probably going to be in the States with his dad for four or five months. But the previous two years, he probably wasn't in the States a month. 
right. between the two years. So he gets a bit of leeway there. So if he's in the States, let's say five months, five times 30 is 150 days, he will not go over that. Right. One eighty three number. Needless to say, anyone it. listening needs to talk to their CPA or you know, their tax advisor and try to sort all this stuff out. But there's options here is the important thing. There's options of the physical presence test, <laughs> which again means you can only be in the United States or on a plane to or from the United States for 35 maximum of 35 days per year. Um, the other is the bona fide residency test. You know, uh, Panama is a great place to get this set up because the friendly nations visa, and we won't get into that, <clears throat> but there's a friendly nations visa for Americans as well as a lot of other countries. I think 43 countries or so last time I checked, which if you're a citizen of that country, then you are fast tra fast tracked in government terms for a permanent <laughs> residency in Panama, you can get the cedula, you set up a bank account, you can get a driver's license. I've gone through it all. I am a permanent resident of Panama, although I've chosen to live in Chiang Mai and travel the world a bit at the moment. <laughs> so let's-, let's uh, You still claim your tax home in Panama though, right? Uh, I have claimed my tax home last year in the States though, because I spent over half a year there. Um, okay, so you so you end up having to pay a prorated amount of tax in the U.S. for last year. Yep, exactly. Yeah, I forgot you were in, that's right, you were in the U.S. for a while last year. I forgot yep. about that. But uh, this year, I guess you'll claim your tax home in Panama, right? Probably Panama since I'm not in, I'm still on a tourist visa in Chiang Mai. So. Um, but yeah. the interesting thing, just real quick as a side note, anybody looking to live in Thailand, so I've, I've lived in Panama for several years, and now I've been in Thailand for a couple months. Both of them are pretty good places to live and work as a digital nomad. I personally uh, think that it's easier to live in Chiang Mai, Thailand, or even Bangkok for that matter, uh, than Panama. The weather's a little bit nicer up here in the north in Chiang Mai. Um, and the food is way cheaper, so you can easily get an awesome meal for two dollars, three dollars, or so. I mean, if I ever spend five bucks, I'm like, whoa, hold on now. What, what you know, am I celebrating something here? But uh, seriously, though, you can, and maybe we'll do, maybe I'll do another episode on the different types of visas around the world that are the easiest for U.S. <clears throat> citizens to to use as a digital nomad. But uh, I'm here in Chiang Mai now, and I want to talk about some structuring for U.S. people. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. every, yep. every, everybody's heard about LLCs. Everybody's heard about this S Corp. And nobody really knows the difference as far as I can tell. What is an LLC? What is an S Corp? And which do you recommend for that guy or girl making $5,000 a month in revenue um, who's thinking about breaking out of this U.S. lifestyle? Sure. So there's, there is a lot of misconception there on, on company types. So first of all, I am going to squash some, some, uh, some things that a lot of people have heard. S Corp, there's no such thing as an S Corp. As an entity, it doesn't actually exist. What you have corporations, you have LLCs, there's other types of entities we won't get into, but what it is, there's a corporation. Once you have a corporation registered, you can choose your tax selection, whether it's a C Corp tax selection or an S Corp tax selection. But you can also choose the same tax selection for an LLC. So for asset protection reasons, I never ever recommend a corporation with the only exception is if you plan to take your company public hmm. in the future. Okay, there's no need to do a corporation because people say, well, but I want an S Corp. Okay, basically, if you need an S Corp for tax reasons, do an LLC and, and file to have the S Corp tax election. Okay, so you get why, the exact same benefits. Why do people think that they need or want an S Corp over an LLC? And what benefits does an LLC in and of itself give someone like <clears> me, for instance? Okay, first of all, an LLC is much more flexible um, and much easier to maintain and operate. You don't, it, it requires a lot less annual reporting and annual upkeep, let's say, to, to maintain an LLC. Secondly, from an asset protection standpoint, and I'm, we don't need to get into an in-depth asset protection discussion, but 
Sim simplified from an asset protection standpoint, if you get sued for a million bucks and your creditors find out you own shares in a corporation, whether it is your own corporation that you own 100% of or you own 1,000 shares of Home Depot stock, they can sue you and take your shares from you in court. They can, yeah. they can basically take your shares. So if you own a, your own company, 100% of your shares, you get sued for a million bucks, they're going to take those shares from you and whatever is in that company, they can just liquidate you know, the assets, drain the bank accounts, whatever. In an LLC, it doesn't work exactly like that. It, it varies based on which state you register your company in. But the way we do LLCs for clients, because we only do them in the states that have good asset protection laws, the, basically, if somebody sues you for a million bucks, they can't just come in and grab the assets of the LLC. Okay? They don't necessarily have the ability. Just because they sue you, Ash, for a million bucks and win, they can't come in and grab the assets of your LLC. They can only essentially stand in line and wait for you to pay them out on profits, which you, you know, there's ways, of, ways around avoiding that. The point is it gives you more flexibility if you get sued. Mm. It also gives you more flexibility in how you run and operate the business, plus you don't have to keep um, uh, minutes and annual reports and stuff like that. It's just a whole lot easier to maintain. But from a tax standpoint, you, your default tax selection for an LLC is a disregarded entity. So it passes through to you. So any profit and loss passes through to you personally or, or whoever owns the LLC. Right. You can choose an S corp tax selection if you want, or a C corp tax selection if you want. But uh, I mean, that's not relevant for most small businesses. I know that most people um, are talking about choosing S corp tax selection for their LLC. Why would they do that? And what are the benefits? If you're living in the U.S., um, that's probably your best scenario because what it, what it gives you is the ability to minimize your social tax. So the social tax is this self-employment tax, the 15.3%. So if you're an employee at a company, um, your employer pays 7.65 and you match the 7.65 right? Total 15.3. But if you're self-employed, if it's your business, you pay the full 15.3% on your taxable income, right? Ponzi so if you make, uh, exactly. So if you're making five grand, right? Five grand a month, 60 grand a year, 15% of that's $9,000. Okay. Yep. However, if you have an S corp, what you can do is you can officially Pay yourself a salary, just like you're a W-2 employee, any other W-2 employee. And what you do, let's say you pay yourself a salary of, let's say, 30000 So now you're going to pay that 15.3% on 30 instead of 60. Right. So it saves you $4,500 right off the top in, in that case. And then you'll still pay the full, your income tax on 60, but you don't pay, you don't have to pay the social tax on your business profit so to speak right okay. okay you only pay it on your official salary now i don't think an s corp is ideal for digital nomads because there are ways you can completely eliminate your tax including your social tax as a digital nomad if you structure your business properly mm. um and it's much harder to do if you're an S corp. You actually want the pass through um, status if you're going to be a digital nomad. So you, a part of it, part of the structure planning involves you need to think about what you're going to do personally too. Like, okay, am I going to be, am I dipping my toes in the water and I'm going to just be kind of a tourist for three months, or am I fully committed to the digital nomad lifestyle and I'm going to do this at least for a few years, right? right? So you need, to, you need to think about that also in what matters. But ultimately, if you, if you structure it properly as a digital nomad, you can eliminate your self-employment tax and your income tax completely if, if you do it properly. If you just operate through an LLC, so let's say you're living in Ohio, making five grand a month selling your widgets on Amazon. Um, and you say, well, you know what, I'm just going to set up an LLC and move to Chiang Mai or move to Panama or Medellin or one of the other hotspots. 
so you're still you you you'll get the the um, foreign earned income exclusion. Assuming you qualify, like we just discussed, right? You'll get the foreign earned income exclusion because that sixty thousand in income is under your your threshold, right? Under your foreign earned income exclusion threshold. So you won't pay any any um, income tax, but you will pay nine thousand dollars in self employment tax, fifteen percent of the sixty. Mm. Okay, right. Right. So, so you get excluded from the personal income tax, but you still have to pay for the Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security taxes. Correct. If if you only do it through a U.S. entity, right? There, I mean, there are ways to eliminate that, but that's what this is. What at least at least ninety nine percent of the people digital nomads I talk to do, because nobody's ever told them that they can eliminate the social tax also, you know, or maybe I get, maybe sometimes I get people that try to make a morality argument that they have a moral obligation to pay tax. I I think it's a moral obligation (laughs) to pay as little taxes as legally possible. Um, But agreed. Yeah. Let's talk about some of those ways to excuse yourself from the social taxes as well. And does this have anything to do do U.S. citizens benefit at all from incorporating, say, like a Belize LLC or some offshore entity and using the offshore banking system, or is that typically going to be more trouble than what it's worth? So it depends on the nature of your business, and I'm going to hit on one topic first, then I'll, I'll back up. First of all, I'd stay away from Belize. I would avoid Belize like hot syphilis. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you, Belize is a disaster, um, and I've done a lot of Belize companies in the past. Belize, a few years ago, had a, a, a major banking crisis. Every bank in Belize got – I mean, you probably know Lost this, their U.S. dollars. All, every, bank, every bank in Belize, in a, in a matter of like a week's period, lost their U.S. dollar correspondent banking relationship because the government of, of Belize refused to play ball with the U.S. Treasury Department. U.S. Treasury went to all their correspondent banks, which in Belize was mostly Bank of America, and yeah. said, stop. So because of that and a few other things, um, Panama Papers and stuff like that, Belize has become very difficult to deal with. And well, it's, it's one a thing lot to of, have a Belize corporation. It's another thing to have a Belize banking stru- a bank account. Would you still <laughs> – right. Right. Would you still recommend the Belize LLCs or IBCs or trusts or and just not the bank accounts in Belize? Or if not, <laughs> what what other jurisdictions do you recommend American citizens <laughs> specifically who are looking to be digital nomads incorporate in? And what's the purpose? What's the benefit of even incorporating outside of the United States? So I, I could tell you this, that. Um, we, we, my business partner and I, we have our trust license in Belize. I mean, we're, we're licensed trust. We're a licensed trust company in Belize. I still don't do Belize <laughs> mm. <laughs> because the problem with Belize is a lot of other countries, like a lot of uh, banks in other countries, they don't want to accept Belize companies anymore to open bank accounts. I mean, it's, it's not impossible. There are some offshore centers. You can still do it, but it's way, way harder. You're going to, you're going to have to jump through so many more hoops with Belize now. And then the other issue there is, let's say you're doing consulting and you have a client, I'm just making a situation up, but you have a client in, let's say Germany and your German client has a bank account at um, Deutsche Bank. Well, they, they need to pay you 10 grand from their Deutsche Bank account and their bank could just say, well, yeah, no, we, we don't wire money to Belize, right? Or we don't, you that's know, what, we that's don't. That's why we Belize saw at your company. Pacific Bank in Saint Vincent. You know, Saint Vincent's not a not a very well known banking jurisdiction, and so banks just it happens simply, all the time. Banks just simply would not send us money. They're like, no, nope, we don't send there. I know. I I just got a notification, and I'm not going to pick on all the offshore banks here, but I just got a notification in my email this morning from another bank in the Caribbean that I'm sure you're familiar with that said, um, we just lost our, U- or, um, our, Euro, our Euro correspondent banking relationship with XYZ Bank. Um, we can no longer do Euros until we get another 
um, isn't it uh, amazing? And Euro now correspondent bank. Now your euros are just they're stuck. I mean, they're you, sitting. Their numbers on a screen, and that's it. That's all they are, right? You they're, can't even convert them. You're right. They can't even convert them because they don't have the liquidity to convert them. It's not like they're sitting on a blockchain somewhere where you can just send them out. Like literally, they can't even send. God, them. don't. Was was that loyal bank? Don't 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 tease me. That was loyal I, bank. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not saying it. That, I'm not. I, I'm not saying. I'm not saying. <laughs> I, I hope it wasn't your Pacific bank. I haven't heard anything, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not picking on anybody directly on your podcast, but let's just say, you know, them. Um, so anyway, this is like, I don't, I don't, I don't have like an agenda against Belize. Like I said, we have our trust license in Belize. It's just, I know how much of a problem it is dealing with Belize. And there's a few other offshore jurisdictions that are like that too. Um, and sometimes the jurisdiction can vary based on what business you're in, what you're doing, what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. So it's hard to say, okay, Cook Islands is good for everything. Right? Well, let's it, just give an just example doesn't... here. Like if, you, if somebody has an FBA or a drop shipping company online, and if they're American and they're looking to do this whole digital nomad lifestyle, is there any benefit for an American citizen to incorporate an offshore entity and start using it to facilitate their business. Because I know firsthand that it's way easier to open up like a PayPal account or a Stripe account, et cetera, if you're a US LLC, as opposed to, um, you know, a Seychelles corporation. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're not opening a PayPal account or a Stripe account with an offshore company. Right. I don't care what jurisdiction it is. I don't have. I don't care how great the jurisdiction is. You are not getting a PayPal account or a Stripe account with an offshore company. So to answer your question specifically about Amazon FBA sellers, I'm going to tell you the structure I recommend for every one of my clients. And most of them raise their eyebrows at me and think, what? But I'll tell you. All right. Every single one of my Amazon clients, what we do is we create a US LLC for their Amazon seller account. Because Amazon will not blink an eye at, at, at a payout to a US structure. Right. Okay? Now... If you were to have a U.S. structure, let's say a Seychelles company, I'm sorry, if you were to have an Amazon account with a Seychelles company, so let's say you, you, you create an Amazon seller account owned by your Seychelles company. Right, yep. At, at, at some point, at some point, it could be now, depending on your situation, Amazon has every legal right and authority to do a 30% automatic withholding on any payout to you. Mm. Okay. And I'm not just picking on Seychelles. I mean, any non U S company that's technically for, that's they for could tax do that purposes for tax purposes, right? Amazon because of FATCA. So right. my God, I had, to, I had to do a FATCA form yesterday. Um, and I, I, I swear to God, you need a PhD in finance and law. You need a Juris Doctorate in Law and a PhD in Finance to know how to read one of these stupid FACTA forms. Well, I can guarantee you that the compliance people at the offshore banks don't know how to do this. Again, no I names. can guarantee it too. No clue. Yeah, <laughs> no names. <laughs> <laughs> Not naming any bank names, but you know them. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I'm telling you, like, you need, you need to be, you need to have a doctorate in law and a PhD in finance to understand these FACA forms. And so basically, it's possible, like, a lot of people come to me, well, I'm going to pick on Hong Kong now, a lot of people come to me and say, why don't we just do a Hong Kong company? Well, mm -hmm. that's great, but they can still do an automatic 30% withholding to right. your company. Um, just because it's a non-U.S. Right. Just because it's international and there's not clear ownership of the beneficial owners of the company that can do a 30% withholding. Right. So you now, recommend a U.S. LLC. I recommend a U.S. LLC, yep. right, right off the bat, because you will never have an issue with Amazon paying. A, and this is for any of your platforms. I don't care. Maybe yep. you've got an eBay store, a Shopify sure. store. Yep. Um, uh, anything a that store. Any anything that requires 
you know, money transmission in the U.S. It's best to have yes. a U.S. company. It simplifies. Now, <clears throat> this is why you want to have a, a, a default tax selection. So most of the time for most of my clients, we're doing either Wyoming or Delaware LLCs in this case. Okay. And basically we do Wyoming or Delaware LLCs. And then that's the owner, let's say, of their seller account. They enter their U.S. tax ID number. We can we apply for tax ID numbers for clients and all this stuff. So, but especially if you're a digital nomad, and now I'm going to talk to your other audience. If you're a non-American, I, I mean, I've already done this twice this week for Canadians, right? If you're a non-American, this is the best possible structure in the world for you if you're a Canadian digital nomad. Offshore offshore company owning your Wyoming LLC because mm. as a, as a Canadian, a Canadian digital nomad, you can basically live tax free as long as you, you know, stay out of you've Canada given up your resident six months. Yes. Yeah, right. You've given up your resident status of Canada. Um, and then you, you draw your salary from your offshore company. Now Americans can do this also, but you have your Amazon seller account owned by your Wyoming LLC, but your Wyoming LLC now is owned by your offshore company. That means, and because you have a default tax election, all the income passes through to your offshore company. Okay, now, however you manage that money is kind of up to you. Like once a month, maybe you wanna do a wire and sweep out your money to the offshore company's account, whatever. But then, now you're accruing all of your 5,000 a month, 5,000 a month, 5,000 a month into your offshore company. This is where you pay yourself your salary right. um, from. Now, the benefit there, now we're back in your example of somebody making five grand a month. Yeah. They got this Wyoming LLC selling all their products on Amazon. Every month they, they do a wire transfer, five grand out to their offshore company bank account. Yeah. Then they pay themselves a quote salary from yeah. their offshore company. I would suggest having a non-US bank account to pay your salary from. Just keep most of your money out of the US if you're being a digital nomad. You can get into the topic of where to open that offshore personal bank account. That, that's irrelevant. Like if you're living in Thailand, maybe just a local Thai account because that's where you're paying your bills, right? And, and some banks will allow you to open up a, a corporate <clears throat> bank account for your international company, as well as a personal bank account. And you can, it's as easy as doing an internal transfer. So if you had your- Correct, and it's a lot cheaper. And it's a lot cheaper. So if you're getting paid by Amazon into your US LLC, your US LLC is owned by your offshore corporation. G give, us a, give us a jurisdiction there for the offshore corporation. We do most, we do most of our companies in Anguilla, second most would be Seychelles. Okay, so you've got an Anguilla, offshore company that owns your Wyoming LLC, which gets paid Correct. from Amazon. You open up a bank account at some bank, right, for the Anguilla company. But you also, mm -hmm. while you're going through the process of the whole KYC <clears throat> process, you go ahead and get a personal account opened up because they already Much have, easier, yeah. yeah. They already have all of your docs. They're already legitimate. And they, basically, it's just an add-on there. Yep. So, so then you're taking. Yeah, and then it's an internal transfer. You're right. right. It's a lot cheaper. Instead of, instead of doing a, a $50 wire transfer to your bank account in Thailand, it's probably a free transfer or a very low cost transfer in dollars. And so the question yep. then is how do I access the money in my. So I've gotten paid. You know, my, my Anguilla company, like the, the parent company, has been paid. I've paid myself a salary from my Anguilla company to my personal bank account and an offshore bank. But then how do I use that money to run my life? Well, one of the best ways is with a uh, debit card. So you need to have sure. a, a bank account that has a MasterCard or Visa so that you can withdraw from ATMs. You can use it point of sale. You can use it online. Right. Um, so yep. th that makes it really easy. That that's, that's, Whenever I was working at, at the bank, um, that was one of the main reasons I saw to have an offshore bank account was especially for non-Americans because the rules for becoming a not a tax um, resident in other countries around the world are a lot more relaxed than in the United States. 
so what they would do Canadian specifically <clears throat> or, or British, you know, would move to Spain for six months and a day and they would do this whole structure and then use the debit cards to, to run their lives. But I, I interrupted mm -hmm. you there, Bobby. No, no, worries. you're, you're right. Basically you just, you just debit cards. You just use debit cards to, to pull cash out and pay your bills and, you know, point of sale purchases, stuff like that. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big cash guy. So, you know, I would prefer to go, what, let's say your limit is a thousand bucks to pull out in cash, pull out your max and just use cash for everything. Um, yes. And get two debit cards if they'll let you. Like when you're ordering a debit card, you can get two debit cards because it's way easier to get an additional debit card than it is to raise the limits on your debit card. And so, you know, if, you, if you're somebody making ten or $20,000 a month, well, you, you may want to go buy a motorcycle one, one week and it's going to take you a couple of days to withdraw your max amount. <laughs> right. Get that motorcycle or take a cruise or something. But remember the, while the, the limits on cash are quite low, maybe 500, a thousand dollars, the limits on point of sale transactions are quite high, like 10,000 us or 10,000 pounds. Right. So at point of sale, you're not really going to run into a problem. Most of these debit cards, the only issue that I see with them is that um, you don't want to use the debit card of your company very often. And I'm, I'm kind of, I'm no. kind of just jumping in because not unless it's a business expense, right? Not unless it's a business expense. Not only is that going to be tax, you know, that's a tax liability, but the bank is also going to see that is a bit more high compliance and they're going to request more anti-money laundering because why do you need to get all of this money out of the ATM for your bank, for your business, right? What you, you need they to do not, you're right. They you don't need, like that. You need to do it the right way, the legal way and pay yourself a salary and then you can pull as much money out of it as you want because it's your personal bank account and that's what debit cards are for. So that's a little inside tip from a random engineer that turned into an offshore banker for five years. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a very valid point. Like a lot of people ask me that all the time. Can I just use my business debit card to pay my bills? Well, technically, yes, you can. I mean, you but can. But I really, really don't recommend it. <laughs> Yeah. You know, pay just you, you have to take that one extra step and pay yourself a salary. Right. It's not that big of a deal just to pay yourself a salary. I mean, especially if you're living like in Thailand, where like my god, you, you're an oligarch on two grand a month, just yeah. about right. And, I mean, you can live you, like a king. And if you get the foreign income, income exclusion when you're paying yourself through the Anguilla company, how does that work for the social taxes if you are if? Right. That's where I was about to go with that. That's about where I was, uh, I was about to go there because, so let's take that structure we just talked about. You're an Amazon seller. You've got a Wyoming company for your seller account owned by your Anguilla company that pa all the income passes through to Anguilla. Right. Now, if you are a digital nomad and you qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion, if you don't do the offshore structure, from the beginning and you you stop at the wyoming you're only doing the wyoming company and you pay yourself a salary from your wyoming company that's it you're it's going to cost you in our example five grand a month 60 grand a year that's going to cost you nine thousand dollars a year in social tax right okay that 15.3 percent social security medicare medicaid yep. blah 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 it costs you nine thousand dollars a year in social tax if you take the next step and add the Anguilla company owning the, the Wyoming company, basically your Wyoming company now has no, it's, well, you don't own it. Your offshore company owns it. All the income flows through to the offshore company. Now there is an additional reporting requirement on your taxes. You have to file a 5471 for uh, owning more than 10% of a foreign corporation plus your your um, FinCEN 114 and maybe your 8938, depending on that, how much money you got yeah, in your account. Right, the FBAR. Yeah, the FinCEN, it's FinCEN 114 now. It's not okay. called the FBAR anymore, but okay. they changed it like a year ago. It's, it, at least now you can do them online, thank God. Like, mm -hmm. my God, our couple, what, two years ago, you had to freaking mail them in. How ridiculous is that? You got to mail an FBAR in and you're living and you're, you're in living Thailand, internationally. It takes a month to get there. How stupid is that? But whatever. Um, but at least now you can do it online. 
So you, you still have, you have some additional reporting. However, you have now become the owner of an offshore company and your salary is from a foreign company that has no obligation to withhold or pay a social tax in the U S right? because your, your income is no longer U S based income. It is now income from a, from a non U S company. It's no different than if you had a job working for Shell Oil in Dubai. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be withholding or paying social tax on you when you live in Dubai working for a Dubai company. Well, right. I'm saying Shell, Shell Dubai. But you're not going to have to pay a, the 15.3% social tax in that case. And it's no different than if you own the company in Anguilla. There's no 15.3% social tax. So taking that extra step in this scenario saves you nine grand a year. Right. And, and remember, you know, you would need to be making at least 50, 60, a hundred thousand dollars in my opinion to make this truly worth it because you, you're going to have to pay to set up the structure, the Anguilla structure. You're going to have to go through and probably pay someone to assist you in setting up an offshore bank account. Yes, you can do it on your own, but it's always, <laughs> it's nice to have a concierge. And if anybody's looking for recommendations, Bobby can help you or, or I can help you as well. Um, it, you, I, I laugh because I, I know the hassle of opening offshore bank accounts now. And if you're not familiar with it, it's, 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 it's just another government program as far as I'm concerned. But once you figure it out, like you and agree. I have, then you can get them open pretty quickly. But, you know, it's, it's, you're going to have to work, pay with someone to open up, you know, uh, the Anguilla company. Somebody like Bobby can help you do that. Uh, the Anguilla company has yearly um, fees associated with it to keep it in good standing. And the bank, you have to pay those fees because the bank accounts will shut, you, I mean, the banks will shut your account down if you can't present them a certificate of good standing every year, which basically means that you've paid the government off for another year. Um, it is going to be a little bit more expensive for some of the debit cards. In the United States, we're used to not paying anything for a debit card, not paying anything to use a debit card, you know, really only paying a couple bucks at the ATM when we use, when we pull cash out. This isn't the case for international debit cards, people. Uh, you're going to be paying maybe 1% whenever you pull out, including uh, a, a bank withdrawal, uh, ATM withdrawal fee for you, the, your offshore bank as well as the local bank that you're pulling the money from, their machine. If you're looking, if you're living in Thailand and you've got a US dollar bank account, you're not going to get a Thai bot international bank account for your company or for yourself. Um, you're going to have to pay typically a 3% uh, Forex fee to convert it from your currency, let's say dollars, into the Thai bot currency so you can pull it out and actually live on it. So there are expenses here, Bobby. Would you say that it makes sense if you're making, what, fifty, sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 a year in your business, then that's when it starts to make sense to do this? 50 is probably about the minimum cut off. And I say that based on you're probably going to spend, I mean, if you do it correctly, like a lot of people try a lot of this do it yourself stuff. Like I'm going to set up my, I'll do my Wyoming LLC myself. And you can do that. Most of the time people screw it up, but because even though you just download the form off the website and fill it in, if you don't really know what you're doing, you're exposing yourself to risk that you don't really even understand you're being exposed to. Right. Um, but if you pay somebody to do it correctly, uh, you're probably looking four or five thousand to set everything up. Um, four or five grand, let's say on the high end, five grand you'll spend uh, to get everything done, including all your fees and maybe getting some notary fees and stuff like that. Yeah. You're probably looking max five grand to set it up. So my, my opinion is, if your benefit is five thousand plus one that's where it starts making sense. Right. You know, and, and you can't dismiss the fact that it, it, it will be a little bit of a hassle in the additional reporting requirements also. Yeah, in, in um, and like you said, the ongoing fees. And, and working, yeah, with the, yeah, and working with, with it's people simple. in the Caribbean is annoying. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, that's true. But the, the um, I mean, it's, it's, it is definitely simpler if you're like, let's say you're selling on Amazon, you have a Wyoming company and you got your personal bank account at Schwab and you, you just basically go travel the world and pull cash out with your Schwab debit card. That is simpler. 
There's no doubt, but you're paying the penalty for that. You're going to pay, you know, at a minimum, you're paying that 15% social tax is going to be your penalty cost Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, for, for simplicity. So you, you, you kind of have to weigh the, the pros and cons on personally what, what's good for you. If you make 50 grand a year, 15% of 50 is what, 7,500 bucks? Yes. Right? right? Yep. So 50% or 15% of 50 grand is 7,500 bucks. If you're willing to put up with some additional hassle mm-hmm. and some additional reporting requirements for the benefit of saving 7,500, I'd say go for it. Yeah, so the first year is probably going to be a wash because you, you highly, I highly recommend you pay a professional, somebody like Bobby to set all this stuff up for you, set up your LLC, set up your Anguilla, you know, LLC or IBC or whatever it is, introduce you to a bank that they have a relationship with. And for the most part, trust, right. They've worked with, you don't want to go through all this by yourself. So the first year it might be a wash, but guess what? The second year, third year, fourth year, hopefully you keep making money and more money the more money you make, then the less, you know, the more you save because that 15% is hopefully going to be growing and it's going to stay in your pocket. Well, and hopefully you're also, you know, it, a lot of digital nomad guys, they're, they're moving to lower cost places to, you know, lower cost of living places. That's true. Saying my Medellin is also a great example where you can live like an absolute king. I was, I was in Medellin a couple of months ago and one of my buddies just rented an apartment there a three level corner penthouse apartment with a rooftop jacuzzi. Um, I mean, unbelievable place. I'm telling you, this is like um, stuff you see in Miami, like that Will Smith would have in some TV show would do an expose about his apartment. Right. And he's paying like $1,500 a month to rent yep. this place. Yeah. Like yep. 1500 bucks a month for, like what would probably cost you in Miami eight million dollars to buy like it's unbelievable the quality of life but you don't have to even live that well like you can have a really damn nice place in Medellin for four or five hundred bucks a month yeah but you know he's just living in a sweet penthouse yeah I mean whenever looking at the cost of living in the United States it's it's actually surprising to live in any cool city I'm not talking about some city or some town out in the middle of the mid Cleveland, Ohio. (laughs) I'm not talking about (laughs) Cleveland, Ohio here. If you go to nomadlist.com and we'll put a link in the show notes as well as links to uh, Bobby's website. And, um, but if you go to nomadlist.com, you can see what, what the community thinks are the best places for nomads to live. And um, Bangkok, Thailand is number one. I, I was in Bangkok for a while. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, but you can click into it and find out like well, what's its cost? What's its internet fun, safety, you know, all sorts of things. Barcelona, Berlin. I'm surprised to see Berlin up there. Both of those are over 2000 us a month to live, but then you have Chiang Mai and it's right around a thousand dollars a month. So not only would you be saving potentially taxes by moving out of the States, getting this foreign income exclusion, setting up an an Anguilla or some offshore corporation to own your US LLC, which is connected and works with your Amazon account, for instance. But you're also, you're saving the taxes associated with that, income taxes and potentially the social taxes, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. But you also are probably living on half or a third of what you would be in the United States. So, you know, I'd like to wrap up here, Bobby. I I personally love living in various places. And although it's a little bit more difficult to build my business whenever I've been traveling, it's way more difficult to build my business. Um, You know, this year I've lived in split Croatia and and Budapest, Hungary, which I really recommend, by the way, Budapest, Hungary is in number six. One of my favorite cities in the world, by the way. (laughs) Uh, I've lived in Lisbon, Portugal, which was which was also one of my favorites. <laughs> and, and now Chiang Mai, Thailand. What I found moving around to find a place you like, live in places for a couple months until you really find what you like, and then for me personally, settling down there for a while so you can continue to grind and build your business. Because you know, living this lifestyle looks great on people's Facebooks and Instagrams. But I can promise you that it's not always toes up in the sun <laughs> by, by the beach somewhere. 
you're still building your business, you're still managing your virtual team. If you don't have a virtual assistant yet, send me an email at ash with an E, A S H E, at libertyvas.com, and we'll see if you would make a good fit for a virtual assistant because nobody builds on their own. But take a look at some of these uh, some of these benefits of living internationally, at least while we can. You know, we haven't had lo a long time now that people like us, Bobby, could be digital nomads. This has only existed for what, 10 years. I mean, I became a digital nomad in 2012, and I feel like I was pushing the envelope back then living in the Caribbean. But you've been one for longer. But all I'm trying to say is the resources are out there. <clears throat> Check out Bobby's website. And we'll include all the show notes. Bobby, what's the best way for people to keep up with you and with globalwealthprotection.com? So our, our website, globalwealthprotection.com. Um, we also have a paid membership group called gwpinsiders.com. The, the membership group is, it's the same type of stuff. We do internationalize your business, your wealth, and your life. We have a lot of paid content in there, stuff that I don't want to put on a, on a public, <laughs> public website, public forum, sure. um, connections to a lot of my, my Rolodex of people. Also members get discounts on our f forming, um, companies. We do, uh, U S companies, offshore companies. Um, they get discounts on forming companies, setting up trusts, opening bank accounts. We do live, live events, uh, once or twice a year. And then also, um, Members can, can register for free 30-minute consultations with me so we can hash out a strategy directly for them. Can I, can I make a point about cost of living? Because th this is something I think that Americans, they just, they're frustrated with it, but they can't wrap their heads around it, is the cost of health care. Mm. Okay? And I don't want to get into an Obamacare discussion or anything about this. Just purely based on the cost of health care, I estimate I save... Dude, I'm, I'm 43 years old, okay? If I were paying for health insurance in the U.S. right now, I'd probably be paying about 700 bucks a month for health insurance, yeah. plus any deductible for anything I'm doing and co-pays and whatever. Let's call it 10 grand a year. I just had surgery a couple weeks ago here um, in Latvia, where I'm living now, on my ankle. I had an old injury several years ago where I broke my ankle. And I had, I had to basically go in and clean up the, the, the joint. So I had surgery a couple weeks ago. Um, I priced that surgery out in the U.S. In the U.S., that surgery was somewhere between twelve dollars and $15,000 to get that done. I would have to pay. If I had health insurance, of course, I'm paying roughly eight to ten grand a year just to have the ability to use it. Then I'm going to pay probably about a 20% deductible on that. So I'm several thousand dollars out of pocket to get that done. In, in Latvia, I paid just under a thousand dollars total cash to get it done. The cost of living to live in many other parts of the world is so much cheaper. It's unfreaking believable how cheap it can be to live in some places and i'm talking about places you don't necessarily think even berlin is not the cheapest place in the world to live but there are other factors that that go into your quality of life that you don't even think about Healthcare is something that nobody really talks about the cost of healthcare. right the simple fact of me moving out of the u.s saves me at least 10 grand a year just in healthcare costs right yeah. And, and like, so, for instance, here in Chiang Mai, you can go to a dentist and get an entire teeth cleaning, mouth cleaning for $20. Right. I it's guess. about the same here. 15 euros is what I pay for a cleaning here. So like, what, $17? And my, my apartment, I mean, it's nothing special. I got it really quickly. It's got a great mountain view and it's clean and modern, $300 a month. Right. Uh, I mean, I can go over and eat an, an incredible meal for five dollars i mean i'm, I'm talking t meat steak what, what would you pay for uh what would you pay for uh, your apartment if you were in let's say austin texas or denver oh in denver this apartment would be fifteen hundred dollars for sure at least yeah at least right yeah. how big is that like 50 60 square meters yeah it's about 50 square meters yeah you pay at least 15 maybe two grand in denver austin yeah. probably the same Yep. And, yeah. and here it's 300 New York. You could get a broom, yeah. a broom closet for three grand. 
three hundred dollars. <laughs> I I rent a scooter every day, right? I just I get a month rental on a scooter for um, about three dollars a day, right? So I'm paying about a hundred a <laughs> hundred dollars a month for a scooter, and I don't have a driver's license in Thailand. I have no desire to get one. Uh, a U.S. license isn't um, respected here. Uh, but if I get pulled over by the cops for not for driving without a license on a motorcycle, it costs me fifteen dollars, and they send me on my way. So you know, there's a lot more freedom. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper. I, I'm shocked whenever I I look at the living cost in some of the areas of the United States. So I'll, I'll wrap up here by saying, if you've yep. got a digital business, and I'm speaking to my audience here, if you have a digital business, and you're able to cash flow that thing, for five thousand dollars a month which isn't easy you know it's gonna take a lot of work for you to figure out that little puzzle to figure all this stuff out how do you set up paypal right how do you open up a corporate bank account how do you set up a crm system when do you need to to hire a virtual assistant how do you keep up with your tickets your email tickets for your staff if you're i mean for your clients right um how do you organize your databases how do you store your files on on google drive i mean there's a lot of moving parts here but if you can start putting this little puzzle together and you can get even if just $5,000 a month coming out of your business, the world's yours. You can literally travel around the world. I mean, I'm not talking living glamorously, but on a $5,000 a month budget, you can <clears throat> live and save more outside of the country than you could possibly live and save inside the United States. And it's too bad because no what, doubt. Does, what does that mean? <laughs> that means talented guys like us, Bobby, and like a lot of the people listening to this show are leaving the United States. And that's what happens whenever governments steal money from their citizens through, and they call it taxation. It drives us out and makes us look for greener pastures where there's more freedom. And where is there more freedom? There's more freedom outside of the States, especially financially speaking. So I'll, I'll, I'll end it right there, Bobby. Anything else you'd like to chat, chat about that we didn't cover? No, I, I mean, I, we, we could go on all day. So if you had a topic you want to hit on, we can do it. But we, we could probably go on all day. So um, well, We might have to get I, you I, back I on the show here, Bobby, to talk about all the places that you've lived and just some of your favorite places and why later on. But, you know, I really appreciate Not a problem. Coming I'm happy to come show. back. I think this is a great one. This is a very, you know, a lot of times people are telling us about their businesses and you've told us about yours, but these are actionable steps that people can take today to, to not only protect their wealth with an LLC in the States, but also protect additional wealth with an offshore corporation. So Bobby, what's your email address again? If, if anybody would like to get this ball rolling. Bobby at globalwealthprotection.com. B-O-B-B-Y at global G L O B A L wealth W E A L T H protection P R O T E C T I O N.com global wealth protection, Bobby Casey. Thank you so much for coming on Liberty entrepreneurs. If you're not a Liberty entrepreneur, I don't know who is. So thank you so much and keep building freedom. <laughs> Thanks Ash. Take care.